Florent Serge and Jean-Claude are speleologists. After having been the first to explore caves found all over the world, they are now in the Tsingis of Ankarana in the north of Madagascar. Their goal? To discover as many caves as possible and to descend where no one has been before. The mountain range of Ankarana is a vast protected area, which is a national park. It takes two days and a four-wheel drive to get there from the capital. Over time, erosion has led to its current appearance. Sharp limestone sinews on the surface and a network of canyons and caves beneath. It's these unexplored caves that have attracted our team. Everything started at home, in front of my computer, my feet in my slippers. I noticed some satellite photos of Ankarana, and in those photos cave mouths could be seen. From that I contacted two friends, and we mounted an expedition to come here. It's a very difficult area to get to. And up till now, there's been no expedition on this plateau. When you see cave mouths like that, it makes you want to go there. The hustle of the last preparations has attracted a band of lemurs. Usually rather timid and hard to spot, these seem to have realized that a campsite may be an easy source of food. They make it their business to inspect the bags before departure. In remote and uninhabited regions, it's impossible to prospect the entire area looking for caves. That would be like looking for a needle in a haystack. If the search by satellite proves effective, this will open up new vistas for the speleological exploration all over the planet. This expedition is a real test of that idea. Starting from there, we'll go to 60, bearing 60 straight ahead. Okay. This is the time for our speleologists to enjoy their favorite activity, being the first to find a cave and explore it. From a speleological point of view, Speleological research is a bit like a hundred years ago in France, which is to say that we know one percent of what exists in Madagascar, and it's that that's so fascinating. What will I discover? Will I be lucky enough to find a major collecting river? Might I find magnificent galleries, and so on? That's what I'd say is the holy grail of the speleologist, who finds something, who explores. What I love the most about speleology is exploring, searching for the unknown. If it's not that, what I like to do in speleology is cave walking, visiting known systems. I think I visit three or four a year, mainly with my children. But I'm not as mad about it as I am about exploring. Often young kids, when you think of it, want to go and see what it's like underground. Well, after seeing that, we wanted to see more. Well, what's good is that this isn't an expedition that has to go fast, so we can take the time to look around. And that's why we can see this very little limu. It's super because it almost looks like part of the tree, because if the porters weren't there to see it, we wouldn't have spotted it. That's what's great about this kind of adventure. It's taking the time to observe, watch, knowing that these little animals need absolutely to be protected. It's so adorable. The team continue their march in the overwhelming heat. First objective, to get to the heart of the range an unexplored area because it's difficult to get to. 
The guide has just told us that there's a difficult passage with blocks and behind that there's forest again, so we're going to cross it. Progress is difficult because the Tsingi range is a fortress. After a four-hour march, the team still hasn't gotten past the ramparts. They have to make continuous detours, tracing their path between the rock and the forest. Here, there are neither maps nor paths. Following the forest canyons allows them to advance a little more easily, but they always end up at a wall of tsingis. So the baggage is put down to try to spot a passage. Here we've walked all morning, a good five hours, and we're confronted with an impassable barrier of Tsingis. So unfortunately we reconnoitred it with Jean-Claude, and sadly we realized that it really is impassable, especially with the gear and the porters, so we've turned around so as to get to another side in order to reach our objective. This time, the team tries to get access leaving from the savanna. It's the end of a dry season here. It's impossible to find water. The precious liquid has to be carried by the porters. Knowing that they're going to have to move about a lot, they've mounted a lightly equipped expedition, taking the minimum for camping and exploring. This means basic comforts, but fortunately, all three are used to difficult conditions. While Florent has crossed Madagascar on foot, on bicycle, and by paraglider, Serge and Jean have participated in some of the best-known exploits of speleology in France and around the world. Notably, they were part of the team that achieved a world record in 1981 in the Jean Bernard Cave in Haute-Savoie, descending to 1,455 meters below ground. Serge has since made many expeditions to Greenland, breaking descent records in the ice sheet. From below, yes. So it's between the ridges on the left and the ridges on the right. Once back in the forest, they have great difficulty finding their way. The forest is very dense and the GPS isn't working properly. It's also impossible to see any landscape. So they try to locate a huge landslip, which would be a reliable reference point for finding the caves. After several hours of rather tough walking to try and find the big landslip, at present we're still quite far from it, but we're going to make camp. Because going back on our tracks, we found a cave, which must be about 60 meters deep. So either we'll kit it out this evening, or we'll explore it this evening or tomorrow. It depends a little how much time we have left before nightfall. After a few days of difficult and fruitless trekking, Serge and Jean-Claude can finally get out the caving equipment and start the real exploring. Okay.
First descent and first disappointment. The shaft is blocked after only 20 meters. It stops here for us, with the bottom of the shaft being completely blocked. But we'll survey it all the same, going back up. Yes, and then we'll go back up this shaft to try and take the galleries that we noticed further away, to try and develop it, go a little further, all the same. Speleology has brought me a lot. I started at 12. At first it was a childhood dream, which began with Jules Verne's voyage to the centre of the earth. And after that, thanks to speleology, I discovered underground diving, which became my trade. Because I was a surface supplied diver for 15 years, I also learned how to work on a rope. And I was a rope access worker as well for 15 years, and I also learned to ski to be able to reach mountain caves. So it's a sport which has really opened up horizons for me. So here is what remains of a gallery which is completely full of scree. It's the low point of the cavity. The water which comes through the shaft on the right has infiltrated under the scree and we can see that it was an ancient gallery, but it's blocked on each side by big collapses. So here we're leaving the gallery, and at once we find a light shaft, that is an erosion, which leads back up to the sky and lights up a little part of the gallery. And after that, we'll take another gallery, and it can be like that, over varying distances, you can find shafts of light cutting through. It's very characteristic of Singis. I found a little puddle of water which might have some interesting things in it, especially since where we are no one has ever been before. And so I'm taking the first sample. So it might be interesting or it might be nothing, but that's what exploring is all about. Well, there it's clear that you can't see anything, but still, it's not bad. I'll note it down, sample number one. Even though he wasn't a scientist to start with, Serge has been trained by the researchers to bring back samples from his expeditions. These will be sent to the Natural History Museum upon his return but night comes quickly in these latitudes. They move on to a second cave that Florent has found a few meters from there. This is the gear for descending and climbing back up. That's the little drill to make new moorings. And there's the hammer, the small things, and the spit fix. Always have to drain, you see. Hello? Uh-huh. Ah, hello there. This is deep. It's a lot deeper than I thought. Up till now, everything I've seen like this, it's been a maximum of 20 meters deep. And generally the bottom was blocked. They hadn't foreseen facing holes as deep as this. Always with the aim of staying as lightly equipped as possible, they had chosen to not take rope longer than 30 meters. Before descending, they must therefore attach the cords so as to be able to go as deep as they can. Jean-Claude, what are you doing? Using a dev? Okay. Using descenders allows the shaft to be explored more easily but the rock has to be equipped beforehand so that the cords don't rub on the walls.
While night falls, Florent lets the bats guard the shaft entry to go and cook. With Jean-Claude, we've often found ourselves with very, very light stuff, you see? That is just about nothing to eat, because he's a guy who likes very light things for carrying, which means we have nothing in our packs. Because when you're exploring, you need something consistent in your mouth and in your stomach. It's too serious a thing to leave to the two cavers, who are gourmets, but who don't know how to cook. After a few hours, Serge and Jean-Claude finally return. We made a great first descent, and Jean-Claude went on a bit further, so he'll tell you the rest, but we got stopped by gear problems, rope. The ropes don't reach right down. There you are, but it's really very cool. Magnificent shaft, powerful, great junctions. And well, after that, since we had to tie the cords onto each other, it got a bit technical, making knots. And after that, it became more and more complicated. And then sadly, in the end, we didn't have enough rope. But we can always come back. That is exploration. No, it's not frustrating, that's caving. We'll come back. At its start, speleology was done using rigid wooden ladders and then using flexible metal ladders. It was only after the Second World War that new techniques appeared. Serge and Jean-Claude are part of that generation of speleologists who perfected and spread modern techniques, such as descending a vertical cord or climbing using an ascender. Every aspect of speleology, of discovery, implies seeking out lighter equipment. To be able to say, the lighter we are, the quicker we can go, and the more efficient we will be. Me and Jean-Claude have been for a long time instructors at the French Speleology School from its beginnings in the modern techniques that we've passed on, which has meant a number of years of our time, running workshops, teaching people to climb ropes, etc., etc. And that's created modern speleology, which is much lighter and which has allowed us to explore huge caves. I think in some regions they're as deep as 2,000 meters. I think that's the case in Russia. Exploration of the underground world has led to many discoveries. Speleology has allowed us to grow an understanding of hydrology for the collection of drinking water, for example, of paleontology and archaeology by the discovery of caves inhabited by prehistoric man, and again, in biology and cartography. For the time being, the team has walked a lot and prospected a lot, but in the end has discovered few caves. It's becoming vital to find the big landslip rapidly, which will lead them, they hope, to the objectives seen on the satellite photos. They shift camp once again. There's the kitchen and the fire side. We'll clear up the leaves around a bit so, so as not to set the forest on fire, because it's very dry. Not a drop of water. We're setting up camp, so we have to clear up the dead leaves and branches around, as there's a few scorpions around here. So this will be base camp, and from this base camp we'll be able to spread out over all the points we've noticed in order to finally make some nice discoveries. Let down by their GPS, they're trying to find out where they are by covering the maximum of terrain by foot. It's a long and fastidious process, but it's the only way to discover the maximum number of unexplored caves. It's not like in France, where some characteristics of the terrain are recognizable. Here, 
the zone has to be covered and the depressions and basins spotted in the hope that water action has dug a hole. After several hours of searching, Serge and Jean-Claude have found nothing. Happily, Florent seems to have been luckier. I found two shafts, one under 20 and one under 15, which is a branching gallery. OK, and uh, did you descend? Wait, it's narrow, like yesterday's. Shafts. Shafts, real shafts, like yesterday. But however, at the bottom, when you see it, there's an opening. But I didn't feel any air current. Two, two, you say? One near there and the other not far oh, off. We'll see that tomorrow. I'm putting the light down. It's not bad at all. Oh, hell, it's even grand. You see the rope's touching here. So watch out descending and take hold on. Look, you'll see you're quite good at that. Don't touch it again. After 50 meters of a totally vertical descent, they discover that the shaft is unfortunately blocked once again. But over their heads, there's an unexpected show. They have the good fortune to be there at the right moment. A few minutes a day, and only a few days of the year, the sun rays come into the cave and light up the walls. We're finally there. After how many days? <laughs> Ended up not believing it anymore. And that's certain, it's Lavacabe, which means the big hole. And from Lavacabe, we'll be able to sight ourselves and try to find the big cave which is behind it. It's really been longer and a lot more complicated than I thought at the start. This landslip is only a starting point, and now it's time to go to the main objective. But to get close to it, thick jungle has to be crossed. 
Here progress is a lot more difficult because we're really in the middle of the jungle, under the Singhis. There's rocks and vegetation which makes us progress slowly with our friend there cutting in front to make a path. We're realizing that we're going further and further into a savage world. And there where we can hear the cries of the parrots, there we're really going to get to our destination, the one we've been looking for for days. So we're a bit excited, as you might expect. We've got where we wanted to go. Now down there, cave or no cave, it's all the same. We can't be sure, but if there's a fine cave, we prefer that. The reward is there. They find themselves in a kind of gigantic stone basin. To escape, water must have dug some galleries. Oh, that's enormous, yes. That cave there is enormous. Because in the rainy season, when all that comes down, and you can see that slope there, and it's dug galleries with a big porch down there. So we'll go and have a little look, survey things, and that'll tell us exactly where that leads to. Without the satellite photos, no one would have thought to come prospecting here. What seemed clear to Jean-Claude from viewing the photos is confirmed before their eyes and under their feet. Didn't you land on your behind coming down there? Come down the channel. Like that you'll find it easier. It's a bit muddy. Yeah, I got a bit of that. Before going further, the team celebrates by having a food break with what they have at hand. Well, I'm proposing a patty on a biscuit. Now that's good. Look here, that's the starter and the pudding at the same time. It's excellent. A dessert we'll have to have in France. Given the opening and the loads of mud we've just come down, whether it's left or right, it's all going to pile up at the bottom, I guess. Well, logically, at some point, we'll be blocked. Now, let's see. We'll carry on. Although the galleries are extremely large, they rapidly get blocked. As Florent foresaw, the huge mass of clay carried by the water in the rainy season has finished up sealing all of the galleries. Jean-Claude makes a last attempt by trying to dig out the sand in a narrow passage. It's finished. Well, in the final passage there's a slight air current, but you'd have to remove the sand and everything, given the distance of the cave. That will be for future generations. It's always worth it to make the first approach to discover the great caves, as grandiose as that, whatever their development and depth. In any case, from the moment one explores and makes the first descent, it's always worth it. The origin of the word Singhis means, in Malagasy, where you have to walk on tiptoe. These extremely sharp rock formations are the result of a combination of three factors. Firstly, the limestone that makes up the Singhis is very pure and is therefore extremely resistant. 
Then, in tropical regions, there is no cycle of freezing and melting which breaks the blades. To finish, the geological layers here are inclined in a special way. You can imagine the difficulty in just progressing when you see the filigree of stone it can make. The roof of Tsingis is a hostile environment. There are few animals, and vegetation has difficulty growing. In fact, as in every limestone range, water doesn't remain on the surface and descends rapidly to deeper layers. The Tsingis are extremely arid throughout the dry season. For the rare plants which manage to survive, they must have special adaptation allowing them to store reserves of water or go very deep to seek water. So after having reached the cave that's here, now we're going to get out of a forest follow a long canyon, and after the last part, some 200 meters, we'll have to cross the Singis to reach the cave we see here. From all points of view, it's an extremely dangerous journey. And there's no room for error, because as you can see, if you fall, you can literally be chopped up by the edges. So be extremely careful. And that implies being used to moving around in the Singhis. And be in good physical condition, because it's not simple. Let's say that moving through the Singhis can't be calculated in meters or in hundreds of meters, but in terms of time. Because you can end up, according to the zone, finding yourself walking for an hour or two and only covering 150 meters. Ah, a real trap, that. This tiny little stone is what is holding up this enormous block. Well, I think we'll pass by elsewhere. <laughs> Despite many detours and some frights, they end up by leaving this razor-sharp labyrinth. After passing over a ridge, they finally arrive at the cave that they baptize the Serpent Cave, in honor of the one they've met along the way. It's a Madagascar boa. Luckily, it's not dangerous to people, just like these Fulgoridae who dance a strange ballet. If you take a good look, almost everything has been found in the world. And in speleology, we have still the chance to have extraordinary moments of discovery. A little bit like those who lived, well, of course, we're not at the same level, but, well, the explorers of a hundred years ago. It's certain no one has ever come here before, and today, this chameleon is meeting a human being for the first time. This doesn't seem to bother it much. Serge and Jean-Claude can now fully enjoy the feeling of being the first to discover these places.
You blame me for being a daydreamer I stare in space for hours You say I'm nowhere in my place But there's a world I can You see, that has a great range, and it's magnificent. And look at the hangings. I don't know what you think. Yes, nice concretions. And that wall there almost looks like an elephant. With the shape. Come and see. Come towards me, look. Isn't that funny? Don't you think? With the thing behind? Funny, huh? There's a really nice concretion of an arch. Hey, you see those little round holes we were talking about? There they are. Bat nests. Mm. There's lots. Take a look. Hi. There's an air current. That's one of the reasons we are trying to get past, because an air current really is synonymous with the possibility to continue. But apparently we're in a kind of chaos of blocks, and trying to get past that isn't easy. <laughs> Uh, that's what we call a bedding plane. It's true, it's not high at all. And at the end there, it's extremely not large at all, not high at all. And that means crawling, so extra efforts. Yes, that's a... It's been a while since this gallery has been flooded in rainy season. You can see that elsewhere. Serge doesn't forget to take samples searching for traces of life. Researchers are particularly interested in the adaptation of organisms to life in darkness. Well, here I'm in the middle of looking at the walls to see if I eventually can find traces of microalgae on the walls. In fact, it's an algae which is capable of living without light and... For the moment, I haven't found anything that will be of interest to the professor. But, well... It's something. It's a bit like a treasure hunt. You can never know upon what you may come across underground. In Borneo, for example, there are strange luminous filaments. It is, in fact, the larval form of the cave fly, the glowworm which makes this trap. The light attracts the rare insects who pass and become stuck helplessly to the gluey silken thread. In New Zealand, the weta is a cricket which hides from all kinds of light, including moonlight. Almost blind, 
they have the special ability to be able to eat their own legs in periods of famine. And underground rivers play an important role. Cave crocodiles have even been found, or perfectly adapted species like the protea. In total darkness, they find their food by echolocation and have oversized external gills. In fact, we never see the shadow side of the caves. We have, of course, a light with us. And what engages us is the shapes, the contours, the colors, and saying to ourselves, there's more, we can go further, really find things, and better understand a caustic system, better understand how it all works. We've arrived at the top of a vertical, and down below we can see a chamber. We'll have to descend. There we are. We've come into a fine gallery, in fact. And now we must find out how to reach the gallery that Jean-Claude is talking about. The voyage continues under the gaze of bats, unaccustomed to seeing passers-by. So as not to lose themselves in the meanders of the cave, and to bring back the equivalent of an underground map, as usual, they survey the places they visit. Okay, shall I go on? Okay. Yes, go on, yes. Can you see me there? Uh, move forward a little, a bit further. Okay, stop. That's good. That's good. Serge is going to place himself. Me, I aim above with my compass and take a direction. Then Serge aims at me with a laser meter to take the distance, and he also measures the slopes. We also note the widths, the heights, and anything which is, how can I put it, characteristic. OK, 32. Any self-respecting speleologist exploring will bring back this kind of document, whether that be in the caves of Madagascar, or anywhere in the world. It's not just a sport, but there's a sporting side, which means you need physical qualities and quite a bit of endurance. And it's also linked to earth sciences, like geology, castology, topography, things that have to be brought back, like documents for eventual follow-ups, either exploration, or to better know underground rivers or just to avoid particular errors in water catchment, etc., etc. So it's true that the speleologist is someone who I would say, in quotation marks, has also a mission to better understand the karstic environment and the depths. They continue by following an underground river. Decidedly, this cave is a gold mine for the speleologists.
We took the boats because now we have no footing and so we have to sail. And we don't know how long we'll have to sail for. It can be very long in this range. There are underground rivers where you can sail sometimes for one or two kilometers. After 300 meters of sailing, the underground river disappears beneath the wall. Serge and Jean-Claude have arrived at the siphon, which marks the end of their progress. But Serge has to hurry in return, as his boat has a leak. When we've brought back the survey, I think that we've got about a kilometre of gallery in all, of which about 400 metres is river. Yes, this does exist in France, even over several kilometres, but there's not the same atmosphere that you find in Madagascar. Already in the way you have to get there, which is something rather exceptional and very difficult, and besides, it's very far away, far away from everything. So it's another kind of speleology, but one which is even more absorbing, and what we have here is really extraordinary. It's worth it. You have to find it. We haven't found the number of caves we thought, but on the other hand, we've been able to ascertain that the method of spotting by satellite photo is valid. There are still at least 20 caves visible on satellite photos that we haven't yet reached. 